Yeah. 
living out of the Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, that a God of that a God, begotten not made, being the one substance of the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And who was crucified also forth on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitting on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son. Who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is saved by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and Apostolic Church. I acknowledge my baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and for the life of the world to come. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's hard to square the, the gospel accounts of Jesus' miracles with, the, with St. Paul's contention that the New Testament is so much more glorious than the Old Testament. And there's no doubt that Jesus' miracles are well miraculous, but uh, compared with the miracles of the Old Testament, they lack a certain je ne sais quoi, a certain, well, what shall I call it, pizzazz. Take the miracle described uh, 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 in the Communion Gospel appointed for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost in the year C of the Common Lectionary. That would be the equivalent of the, uh, today's uh, 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 the 12th Sunday after Trinity. It's St. Luke's account of the healing of uh, uh, a woman afflicted with scoliosis. All Jesus does is lay hands on her and say, woman, you're released from your infirmity. That's all there is to it. It's all over by the shouting. A woman who has been hunched over and, and scrunched up for 18 years stands up straight, gives thanks to God, and it's all over. It's really rather prosaic. And then, if you take the, today's communion gospel, St. Mark's account of the healing of the a deaf man with a speech impediment. And uh, Jesus simply sticks his fingers in the deaf man's uh, ears, spits on his fingers, touches the guy's tongue. There's nothing very glorious about that. Actually, anything that sounds a bit insanitary. Now contrast these two miracles with the miracles that God performs in the Old Testament. He parts the Red Sea so the children of Israel can walk across dry shop. He makes the sun stand still in the heavens so the Israelites can win a battle. He knocks down the walls of Jericho to save them uh, storming. Now those are really impressive miracles. Those are miracles that really have possessed. Search as one might, the New Testament has very little to compare with them. I guess you could argue that the virgin birth is really quite impressive, especially the bit about the angel choirs. But the only people uh, there to witness them were a bunch of horny handed sons of toil from the local sheep herd herding operation. And the, the resurrection, I suppose, was also actually quite astounding, but the only witnesses, or the only people present, was an infantry squad. And that they slept all the way through it. Even Jesus' most spectacular miracles are decided low, decidedly low key. I mean, when he raises people from the dead, there's no shazam to it at all, no pizzazz. At the little town of Nain, for example, he simply walks up to the co a corpse and says, OK, kid, get up. And then there's the raising of Lazarus. More of the same. The huge crowd is waiting in the graveyard and they're waiting for something really spectacular. And Jesus simply strolls up to the grave and says, Lazarus, come out! Um, I suppose you could say that his, his miraculous feelings are really very much more impressive. And it's very hard not to be impressed with the feeling of 
4,000 and 5,000 men together with their families and hangers on from a few loaves of bread and a couple of smoked fish. But, you know, think about it. Why? When he has all the power in the universe at his command, did he give them a tuna sandwich? You know, he could just as easily have given them a seven course meal with appropriate wines and cordials. Now, that would really have pizzazz. In chapter, uh, chapter 3 of uh, 2 Corinthians, St. Paul addresses the issue of people who find uh, the God incarnate in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, far less impressive than God as we encounter him in the Old Testament. Paul says we need to look beyond the pizzazz. We need to look beyond the thunder and lightning, the crashing of walls and the, and the, and the splashing of the sea. What we need to do is, is look at how God acts when he's incarnate in human flesh. So if we do that, we'll find out that he's not merely impressive, that, but he's simply breathtaking. Part of the trouble, you see, is that we picture God as being rather like ourselves, only infinitely more powerful, with all of our, uh, our virtues and none of our vices. Yet God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells us that he's nothing like us. That uh, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and our, his, way, uh, uh, his ways are not our ways. And uh, there's, uh, one has to say, there's nothing, nothing more obvious in the, uh, the, the, uh, New Test the New Testament, the Gospels, the four Gospels, to show us that that's an entirely true statement. One of the reasons we might find Jesus rather less than impressive is we tend to confuse human notions of glory with God's idea of glory. And the Gospels show they are by no means the same thing. God's notions of glory differ from ours because he doesn't actually need the pomp and circumstance. Infinite power is ever at his fingertips. All he has to do is utter the word and it's done. For human beings, such godlike powers would be absolutely astounding, all the superlatives one can imagine. But for God, infinite power is always with him. It's like us turning on a faucet. And this is graphically illustrated through the remarkably un uh, unassuming way in which he heals the, de the deaf man and the woman with scoliosis. There's no song and dance. There's no lengthy prayers, there's no effort to impress the bystanders. In the case of the deaf man, Jesus simply put, takes him aside, puts his fingers in the man's ears, spits on his finger, touches the man's tongue and says, open up. That's all there is to it. What could be more modest? Yet what follows, what follows is a miracle of creation. An act of creation in my cosm, as astounding as the creation of the universe. Miraculously, the man's mouth were formed, or all oral passages are opened, his eardrums are repaired. Miraculously, the string of his tongue is loosed, as the King James Bible so poetically puts it. Now, it's true that today it might be possible for doctors to create this miracle of healing. And they certainly couldn't do it as Jesus did it, simply by uttering a single word. Our notions of glory might not matter to God, but that doesn't mean that glorifying him shouldn't matter to us. In fact, it's absolutely vital for our spiritual welfare that we glorify him. If we fail to ascribe to Jesus glory and power, dominion and majesty, We'll lose sight of the fact that he's the Son of God, that he's our Creator. And if we do that, like Adam and Eve, we shall fancy ourselves to be gods eventually, making up our own minds what's good and what's evil, with catastrophic results. We simply cannot afford to uh, be uh, casual in our worship. God doesn't need our eloquent words, our glorious music, our gorgeous vestments. We're the ones who need them. 
We need them because we need the splendour and glory to teach us just who God really is and to keep that in the forefront of our minds. And just as important, we need it to know where we stand in relationship to Him and to keep that ever present with us. Amen. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and for ever. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church for living here on earth. Almighty and ever living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men, we most humbly beseech thee and most mercifully to accept our oblations, and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth unity and concord, and grant that all they who confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially in thy servants, Juan, our Archbishop, and William, our Bishop, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, show forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all those who, in this transitory life, are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those who we now mention in the secrecy of our hearts. And we also bless thy holy name for all those thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Ye that you truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and pray of our men of all sins and wickedness, which we from time to time have speak to you. By thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking the disgust of thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent, and our heart is sorry for these our misdemeanors. The remembrance of death is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, 
cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sins of the world. Happy are they who are called to his supper. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Thou wilt take us away. 